Hello class, it's Professor, AKA Coach Benegas. And I'm here today to share with you a paper I did in graduate school on the idea of manifest destiny. And is it luck or is it true? Meaning, is it God's will? So today I'm gonna to share that with you. And at the same time, I'm, gonna I'm going to share how I wrote it and the process it takes to create a research paper. More importantly, how to not waste your time and to organize your notes to where when it comes to making your outline, your notes will be pretty much um, in, in line with what you're gonna put in your outline and then write. So it's there's a lot of things I learned over, over the years, late in the game, in graduate school, towards the end, and so I would basically, I'm trying to give you what I never had, which was this kind of, you know, a little more detail on how to write research papers. But before that, I want to talk about the Mexican period. So from a Kumeyaay, I'm a quarter Kumeyaay, Liseño, and Capeño. So when I teach and think of, of the Mexican period, I think of it differently than those in Chicano studies. So Rudolfo Acuna of, uh, of He's the one of the preeminent scholars of Chicano history. He wrote Occupied America. So in that book, as well as The Crucible of Struggle, this is another one, Vargas. This is the one I use. It's a little less biased than Occupied America. Both great books. Um, is that they teach from the, the Mexican perspective. And so from a Kumeyaay perspective, it's I think it's more, uh, it, it takes into account the, the period before. And, and when it comes to the Mexican scholars, they just think about that one window. For example, the Spanish period was in this area was 1769. That's when Father Sarah came and um, the Spanish period began. That ended with secularization um, in, in, with the Mexican Revolution in the 20s, 1820s. Um, secularization happened in 1833. So, but if you, if you take the timeline of the end of the Spanish period to the beginning of the American period, it's only 25 years. So I think it's important to remember that. Um, so the, this land was Kumeyaay, was native territory for thousands and thousands of years and all of America was. And these small periods we're talking about are just, just the tip of the spear of the timeline. So it's important to keep that perspective when you're talking about whose land it really was. Um, but so that being said, so you have to start with the Texas revolt of 1836. So what happened was there were more Americans in Texas territory during this time. So by 1841, 21,000 Americans lived in Texas and this out, they outnumbered the Tejinos Tejanos, excuse me, five to one. And this, this is a result of a terrible foreign policy by the Mexican government, which needed a buffer against Native American raids, the Apaches, the Comanches, the Navajo. Um, mostly the Apaches though, were basically terrorizing and creating these, these towns were under siege. And you may be seeing movies like that rep, um, represent this time period. Um, so, what happened was, so it, you have to start with 1836. So let's go to California now. So California had 6,500 to 7,000 Californios. And these were the, the landed class, the, the folks who basically gobbled up all the land after the Spanish left. And much of this land again was Kumeyaay, was, was uh, Chumash, it was all these, all these California tribes were, were basically disenfranchised by this new, in a way it was almost, it was like a continuation of the Spanish being here. So there's a lot of similarities between the Spanish and the Mexican period, um, as well as differences. So with these Californios, there, there was a bunch of ranchers up and down California. And this, there was the Spanish speaking cattle barons that were the, were based their wealth was based on the exploitation of their Indian and Mexican workers. 
in a way that gave these ranches the feel of plantations. So there were serious working condition problems that almost represent you know, what was going on in America at the time of these plantations in the South. So like for instance, my, my ancestors in this area were being exploited for sure by, by the Mexican um, Californios to do you know, grueling work for, for very, very little, little amount of, of pay and very little rights. So it's important to remember that. So um, what happened was, so as we're going on this time period, so the 1844 campaign, the, the, the most important issue of the time was the annexation of Mexico and Polk who, who won the presidency, James K. Polk won on this ticket, on this message saying he was gonna annex the, the Mexican territory all the way to the ocean. That was the point because you wanted to get to the ports of Monterey and San Diego, and then that would open up the global market to the to Pacific. So this idea of manifest destiny was in the global consciousness at the time, but it was symbol, it was embodied in this term manifest destiny that O'Sullivan, he was a newspaper editor in Washington, DC, um, to be sure. He was the United States Magazine and Democratic Review of Washington, DC, uh, what supported slavery, Indian removal, and war with Mexico. It articulated the prevailing, prevailing national sentiment of westward expansion. So racism was used to justify the, this um, expansion. And Mexicans were looked at as, you know, and we'll cover that, I'll cover that later in, in our in PowerPoint, but they were considered less than, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So what happened was the, the Mexican war was a manufactured war. So it, it, just to put it simply, in, in Texas, there was this region where there, there were two rivers. And one river was the Nisus and one was the Rio Grande. I'm probably butchering that first river's name. But the, the point was is that this, there was this really fertile per piece of property in the middle in that area. And the, the current territory boundary line was the Nisus River. And the Americans wanted to go all the way to the Rio Grande to get to the river, but also that fertile pro uh, land in the middle of the rivers. So what, what happened was, the, the president sent a bunch of troops down in the area. The Mexicans defended their territory and the Americans uh, claimed that, um, let, me, let me quote from the president. Excuse me, let me find this. So Polk states, Mexico has invaded our territory and shed American blood on American soil. So yeah, that was, <laughs> this is what governments do over time. The Nazis were really good at this, by the way. Um, and so, yeah, so we were the aggressors. We were the ones that were on their territory, yet we say, oh, they, they attacked us. On and on, you know, this is, this is ubiquitous in, in American history. Um, so it's just good to be aware of that. So as, as this, as the war ensued, uh, it's important to, to, to realize who, who was the main, main players. So the Californios were the main players in California. And I'm gonna stick to California a lot today. I could talk a lot about New Mexico or Texas, but because of time, I'm gonna talk about California. But so one of the things that's important to realize is the economies to California and to the, to the East Coast were intertwined. So between the Mexican period of, excuse me, let me find my notes again. Okay, so between 1826 and 1848, Right, this would be the Mexican period. Six million hides and seven tons of tallow were shipped from California to Boston. 
the high trade was centered in San Diego. So which Choice Harbor was particularly de desirable. American interests in California thus rested with its potential to help American merchants gain a greater foothold in the Asian Pacific trade. And this became a main cause in California's contribution to the start of the Mexican War. Settle of, of America, of excuse me, settlement of California and Americans was key to its conquest by the United States. So California played a really pivotal key role in the reason why Me the Mexican-American War was started. It was this crown jewel, if you will. And California, by the way, is some of the best land in the entire world. So if you if you take all, all the, the things that are good about it, in particularly Sacramento Valley and how much how much you can yield per year uh, for you know fruit, uh, wheat, crops, all that. It's it's unrivaled in in the globe in, ge in ge geographically wise. And the water table, all these things are like are perfect, and you can't find them in many many places. Plus the the weather weather patterns as well. So you have this this important um, economies tied. And what that did was the Californios didn't really care about Mexico um, government. And they thought, they thought nothing would change. They thought, look, we're already connected with Boston. We're sending, you know, millions of hides and tons of tallow every year. And this, this was used during the Industrial Revolution on the East Coast. The North, in particular, was the, the epicenter of manufacturing. So hides were used for shoes, but also for machinery and all that. So we were, we were a part of that indirectly, California was. And, and so you have this kind of strange understanding that, you know, folks didn't really, you know, so, but what it did was this. So when the Mexicans and when all, all this was happening, there wasn't much resistance. So when the Americans came here to San Diego, for instance, they just came and raised the flag downtown and like, oh, all right, this is American territory. No one cared. It was like a non-event. And that's kind of how it was a lot in a lot of the Southwest territories. This would be the northern ter northern western territories if you're looking at it from Mexico perspective. So the regional economies were tied together, which this allowed you know almost no resistance in many areas. Mexican government was factionalized uh, with tenuous control in the northern territories, and many Californios thought nothing would be lost. The other thing to realize is Mexican Mexican consciousness had a weak nationalism, so. That's one thing why they didn't want to fight for a war. They, a country they really didn't feel a part of. So we, we're going to move on to, to, the, to the slideshow. I think I covered everything in this, in my notes. And um, for now. So yes, so I'm going to move on to my slideshow. And this is, and this is going to be a kind of a, a two birds uh, with one stone type thing, because what I want to do is I want to show you how to read, uh, write a research paper as a historian. Um, so so this, this paper I wrote in grad school at USD in Chicano history was, is it manifest destiny or is it dumb luck? You probably know what I'm going to, <laughs> to conclude. So, but you know, that's the other thing, you know, when you're writing a paper, you, you can't just say something, you have to prove it with his, facts, with historical facts. So it's important to have an opinion, but it's more important to back it up with facts. So um, I would like to demonstrate the process I use because uh, it's about content and the process is so important. So this is what it, how, how any, any good research paper starts is it's with a question. So you want, you want to know what a thesis statement is. It's, it's a question. And your paper is the answer. So thesis, I know it sounds weird. It sounds, it sounds you know, scary. But it's just a question. You know, for, for my um, master's thesis, I, did, I simply answered the question, is Indian gaming good or bad? And, and so today we're going to ask, is Manifest Destiny a historical accident? So what you want to do is create blocks. Um, and so this is one piece of paper and I would do, um, you know, up here, I would put, th this, these are the topics I wanna cover. 
So is is it an accident? Is it his, is it a historical accident of some grand design or not some grand design? Excuse me. Uh, racial equality, geography, demographics, and so U.S. destined to 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 conquer the Southwest manifest destiny was limited. So I mean, think this is kind of a little complicated in a way. Um, this is grad school material, but in in a way though, think about these as your your paper. So what 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 cover what topics are you interested in? And so you would put, okay, this is what um you know I want to put something right here. This is what I also want to find. But more importantly, you got to make sure these tie into answering your thesis statement. So it's got to all connect. You don't want just random random um, blocks up there. The next you would do, okay, the United States. Okay, what was going on in the United States at the time? Okay, and then, then, then this is where this, this makes more sense. So Reeves, start here. Okay, what was the racial equality like? What was the geography like? What was the demographic like? And then as you're going through uh, the, you know, as well as Mexico, you, you, you do the same. And so, my, so as, you're, as you're reading your, your, your books, or your articles, you're plugging them in here. So you're not just wasting your time. You're not just writing notes. You're writing notes that actually are gonna support your thesis statement. And so this is a big thing I learned in college rather late is you don't wanna waste your time. And the more organized you are, the more you know uh, where you wanna go, the faster you're going to get there. And I spent many, many, many years just writing terrible papers that were contradicting itself and I wrote notes. I wrote everything I could think of on all my notes. And I was taking notes for just taking notes. And that's what you don't want to do when it comes to a research paper. You want to take notes that are focused on your topic and you will more or less use. Uh, and so these are the notes I used that we'll, we'll show you later how it turns into a paper. So on the end, then I stood on the, on the back. I, I also used the back with you know with the same square and so say so you can use the other side of your paper and the other thing i would suggest too is use maybe different colors you know i, I now i use more colors i have like a whole pen color collection when i do notes and stuff like that so you can do that so you want to organize your thoughts organize your notes and your categories and boxes interact with your reading material highlight write notes in the margin reread if you have to that's a big one people don't do Sometimes you have to read things over again. And, and that's just how it goes. You know, uh, I've had to read books for this class, you know, 10 times, you know, before I get it. And I'm still gonna keep doing that. If you don't know um, a word, excuse me, that should say word. If you don't know word, look it up. That's the other thing I found very important early in my life is when I didn't know a word, I always had this little, Oxford Dictionary. I looked up every single word I didn't know. And, and um, now you can use it on your phone, of course. So you can, and then here's the thing, you can create your thesis from your notes. So your thesis is your answer, right? Your, your no, your thesis is your question um, and answer. It's, it's, it's both. So it's the answer to your question. So to some extent, you can create your thesis statement from your notes. Uh, for instance, when I did my thing on Indian gaming, I said, you know, yeah, gaming is good because it gave us, brought us out of poverty. It gives us free education. It gives us housing, all these things. And that's, that would be from my notes. Okay, you read all your notes. Okay, this is the answer. Then prove it. Use in the categories as body paragraphs. So, so you're creating body, your body paragraphs will basically be your answers, your you know, like I said, so um, uh, it, we'll, we'll get to it right here with the outline. This is the body paragraph. So from the notes, I created an outline. So this is the outline I used. So, so here's why Manifest Destiny was dumb luck. It wasn't God's plan. It was because, um, okay, geography was a big one not to be outdone by politics, economics, foreign policy, or demographics. Geography was perhaps the most significant historical accident that gave the Southwest to the United States. So that's what um, a book said, and I really, it, it's true. 
Um, so that was one of my notes. And then you go to transportation, communication, all these things. So you, you break it down into categories to prove your thesis statement, geography, demographics, politics, economics, racial equality, and foreign policy. You could write a book with, this is, if, if I were to write a book, this is what I would do. You break it down into categories, and then these are your body paragraphs, or if it were a book, chapters to, to, to create. So you're, you're not wasting your time. You, you, have a, you have your blueprint, your template, and now you're just plugging in. Okay, what was, here's demographics. The population um, grew from 3 million to 17 million by 1840. Um, that's 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 a United States. This is one of the biggest population booms in, in history between that time. However, Mexico did not grow from 1810. Um, so there's there's a paragraph or two that you could write just with that alone. And then you're going to want to quote that source. So Rodriguez 17, you notice that? That's how I would quote, right? That's fine if you want to quote. That's what I did for a very long time. I just put the last name of the author and this the the, um, the page number in brackets and then put it in a bibliography. So I, when I go, oh, Rodriguez, I can go to the back. Most teachers are cool with that. There is something I want to, um, while, while I do this, so I want to share, um, to properly cite, you use, um, so this is the Chicago, uh, what is this called? Yeah, the Chicago Manual of Style, 16 edition. All right, so this is the Chicago style, they have MLA. And then in here you, you have, oh, see you come across web, the internet, all that. They have, they have smaller versions of these. So there's a couple different ways to cite. As you climb the ladder to the, to the upper, you know, grad school, you're gonna have to cite like that. Um, that's kind of a um, most, I'm not really too care. I don't really care as long as I know where you got it. And, but some students are, our teachers are pretty um, strict on that stuff. All right, so there's that. Oops, um, research. What is the question? What is the answer? Your answer is your thesis. And so a thesis statement though, here's one thing that bothered me in grad school was they want you to come up with your thesis statement before you do research. And I think that's ridiculous. I think your your thesis statement should come from your research. And I, I, I don't know why they don't say that in grad school, but it's the weirdest thing. And to me, it's such a it's such a common sense idea. It's like, how do you know your answer without doing your research? So start out with your question, don't have an answer, do your research, boom, there's your thesis statement with your research. Just a little pet peeve I had. So here we are. Let's let's, let's start with our, our little our, our presentation. So manifest destiny was a religious justification to take land. M most folks don't realize that, but many many things are founded on religion, and they're not religion is not given enough credit when many many things are founded on religion. Capitalism, for instance, was founded through the Protestant work ethic, Max Weber uh, found, figured that out um, in the 1800s. So uh, Mexican War of 1846 and 1848 concluded where, with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, that half of Mexico would be ceded to the United States. The United States experienced almost 100 years of war with Indians before the 1850s. And when California achieved statehood, they carried a lot of prejudice with them. The doctrine of manifest destiny was the ideological slogan used to justify the appropriation of Indian land and was coined by O'Sullivan in 1848. So the core of manifest destiny is this. The brainchild of manf manifest destiny had no regard for native inhabitants of North America and assumed the West was empty space. When they talked about it, it was like no one was there. At its core, the doctrine of manifest destiny is the idea that God ordained the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant to move west because they were the most qualified. They had the best government, the best economy, the best religious beliefs, the best, etc. 
Uh, everyone probably familiar with this, American Progress. This is the manifest destiny kind of, you know, flag of, of what it means. And this, there, this is the idea that civilization is being brought to subdue the wild. And, and that's how I would sum this up in, you know, in, a, in a nutshell. You see the, the train, the, the symbol of the ultimate symbol of industrial revolution taking over the, the wild Indians, uh, half naked, running away with their buffalo. Um, so I guess so from, from the Kumeyaay perspective, from from native perspective, there's a couple of different perspectives you can use when you're when you're studying manifest destiny, but from the native perspective, which I think is the one that should be talked about most, uh, it propagated the displacement of Indian land, uh, land that was considered sacred, by the way, in the way that the Israel is sacred to the Muslims, Christian, and Jews, were taken away at a rapid pace. Uh, during the American period. Unlike the Spanish, for whom the natives were to be included in their civiliz civilizing mission, the, the Americans viewed the natives as a problem and wanted to wipe them out. And this is where the genocidal policy happened. And, and so there's a couple of nuances there. There's a lot more to be said, but for the, but for the most part, the Spanish wanted to incorporate the natives at the lowest bottom of the Costa system tier. So there were five tiers, the whites at the top, the mestizos in the middle and the indios in the bottom. The natives wanted to incorporate the native American population as citizens, but at the bottom tier of their society, if you know Costa system or caste system in India. However, the Americans didn't want that at all. They wanted no part in American uh, just like Abraham Lincoln wanted to ship all the Africans back to uh, Africa. Um, the same could be said about how they felt about Native Americans. They wanted them to be gone, period. They didn't want to assimilate them, incorporate them into society until much, much, much later. Um, so here is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. We have here, um, you know, a, a map of what was taken as a, as a pos as a response uh, as a consequence of the war. So you got a fraction of Colorado, a little, a little panhandle of uh, Oklahoma or that little little thing in uh, Oklahoma, that little strip, excuse me. And this is the uh, basically that territory that was was the red part was taken as a, as a, a consequence. So US did not win the Southwest. Mexico lost it from a series of historical accidents that involved political, economic, foreign policy, demographic, geographic, and religious region, reasons. Significantly, Mexico lacked an inland waterway with mostly desert in the north, which made settling the Southwest nearly impossible. Geographics was the most important part. Political instability was probably the second. Um, and ruined the Mexican economy, especially mining and demographic favor was always on the side of the United States. So the demographics, so, and Native said it too, Americans spread like locusts and probably the Mexicans said it as well, as their demographics was stagnant, the American demographics exploded. And we just said that earlier um, about that rise in millions uh, to 1840. So the United States looked at all these factors as a sign of divine favor. But this was just a series of historical accidents. So the lack of experience. So from 1821 to 1851, 30 years, there was four different constitutions in Mexico. <laughs> Imagine that, right? So we are, we're in America, 1778, um, 1776. We've had a constitution for a long time. I can't, I can't ex remember the exact day it was ratifying, but yeah, so that's when we, be we became, um, you know, America with one constitution. They had four in 30 years. They also had 40 different governments, 40 chief executives. So they had no formal experience resolving conflict. And if you, um, I've actually went to Mexico City. I lived in Guadalajara for a while. And it's, this is a cool place to visit. This is the, 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 the very, you know, uh, town square of Mexico City. 
with this really beautiful uh, church. It's really big. It's massive, incredible. And, and um, Diego Rivera, the great muralist, has some of the best, best murals. I think in this building, uh, not in the church, but I think in the one in the middle or over here, really cool murals um, that really, really we'll never forget. Um, so political instability equals economic loss. So politics and economics are so, they're one in the same. And so with this political instability, Mexico was easy prey to foreign aggressors. Uh, it, it, had, it, it was invaded by Spain in 1829, in France in 1838, in the United States in 1847, England, Spain, and France in 1861. Um, so yes, and Guanajuato is the reason why I have that there. I went, I've been there. That's a cool, awesome colonial city. It's so really, it's just a special city and it has remnants. It's one of the most like, I don't know, uh, symbolic of the Mexican colonial period. And it's just a really special place. You get a chance, I'm kind of just letting you know if you have ideas or if you want options to travel. The United States and Mexico, are, the economies were equal in 1810. Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> By 1821, the US, US economy was su far superior. So in 11 years, um, what happened? What happened in those 11 years? One of the main things was this. So 80% of Mexico's GDP came from mining. And this is, a sim this is symbolic of colonial systems in general, where you're just extracting resources and sending them to the developed world. And we still have this going on in Mexico, and, and Latin American countries in a form of neo-colonialism, which is why they're still in the state they are, because they're not manufacturing and developing finished goods. Um, so this mining contributed to 80% of the GDP, 80%. Mexico was the number one supplier of silver. It was highly capital intensive though, and it, you needed all this money for the extraction. So mining still is this very, very, very intensive highly intensive capitalistic uh, venture. Um, by 1804 though, the crown assumed all loans of the church in 1804. Investment capital was hard to come by after 1800. So you would say as, and this is, the, so Spain started to decline by, so in 1769, that's when the Spanish came here. They were, they were on their decline already. And by 1800s, they were full in full swing of their decline. That's why they started pulling out their resource from the new world. And, and so this is a, a, a part of the, I, the Spanish um, and end of the Spanish empire. And Mexico is on the receiving end of that. So unlucky geography. So the most significant historical accident that gave the Southwest, gave the Southwest to the United States was geography. Now, Mexico was without navigable rivers. Without navigable rivers, communication and transportation were extremely difficult uh, without an inland waterway. You didn't have any other way to transport goods if you couldn't, didn't have a river. Um, and roads were really impossible. You, you didn't have roads like you did back then or now back then where they were paved and you know a big rain would come up and it would ruin the whole road. So without an inland waterway like the Mississippi, Northern Mexico had to rely on land routes. One third of Mexico is a desert. The most barren wasteland is in the Northern part of Mexico. And this gave Mexico an extreme disadvantage in settling the Southwest. Mexico was, mo was impoverished um, with the most important resource known to man, agricultural land. So again, talking about California, Mexico was the opposite of that. Um, you know, California is the breadbasket of the United States. Northern Mexico is the, the desert basket, for instance. Uh, no food's coming out of there. By accident, the United States had the Mississippi Waterway that gave them the opportunity to settle the west rather, southwest rather conveniently. So this Mississippi is everything when it comes to going farther um, in, into towards California. Without the Mississippi and all these inland waterways, Missouri, Arkansas, Illinois, Ohio, you wouldn't have 
Uh, it probably would have took maybe 100 more years to settle the West or Southwest. So the, the Mississippi is one of the most important rivers in, in, in the world as far as world history goes because of this factor. Um, population in Mexico did not grow. We co covered that before. It stayed the same for 60 years, 1810, 1870. It stayed at 6 million. 600,000 Mexicans or one tenth died in the independence uh, fight for independence in 1821. Many of the deceased were Mexico's talent based um, and that could have helped compete with the United States. So here's the population figures for you. Uh, US population grew from 3 million to 17 million in 1840s. And then it keeps on going, it doubles by 1860 to 31 million. So you have this insane, um, and this is the height of the industrial revolution with the railroad and all that happening. And, and you had all these, so you needed people, you needed bodies to accompany the explosion of industrial um, products and manufacturing. Uh, so unlucky foreign policy. In 1821 and 1828, Mexico invited <laughs> Americans to settle the Southwest. So again, this is one of the, this is why Texas had their revolution, by the way. So without a doubt, some Americans would have came anyways. But because of the, the, the Indian raids, Mexico invited Americans to settle the Southwest and gave them land grants and all that stuff. In fact, you have War Warner's Ranch up here was a, Mex a white dude, excuse my French, got a, got a Mexican land grant. I forgot the first one, uh, but that's interesting history. And I had a student in this class too, that her family is a local San Diegan and they had a Mexican land grant as well. So you have all these invitation from, from, um, um, from the Mexican government to have Anglos settle Northern Territory as a buffer zone against Indian raids. And the primary concern was Comanche invasions. These, they were ruthless. Uh, this, these cities were under siege. These towns were under siege. This, this would inevitably make the annexation of Texas inevitable because there were more Mex Americans to, Tex the, to Mexicans, Tejanos, five to one. Um, and the other thing to realize too is that the religion. So when you study religion, and, and it's so important to study religion more when you, when, when you ask the question why. So when, when it comes to religion, Mexicans were Catholics, Americans were Protestants, and they're very different religion. So the Virgin of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, no, excuse me, the Virgin of Guadalupe, um, that's, that's, a, a, that's a, um, a typo. I actually went to see this. Now this is in Mexico City. This was uh, Juan Diego wore a, 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 a poncho. And the reason why this is important is because this is when Christianity comes to the new world. And the Virgin Mary is seen by Juan Diego. And to prove that it happened, this picture was printed you know, by the divine God on, on him as after he saw her to prove that, that she was here. So that's, if you're wondering why it's such a big deal, it's because before this Christianity, all the revelations happened in the old world. And I'm using that because I don't really like that term. Um, we were actually, you know, our civilizations were just as old as over there. Uh, some, some would argue, but in the old world, they did, they all had all their all their special you know revelations. So here's here's a new revelation in the new world, and that's why this version of Guadalupe uh, Guadalupe is so important. But the church became a symbol of stability, not movement. And if you study Protestantism and Catholicism, Protestantism is all about movement and progress. So the idea of manifest destiny itself is progress and movement. Catholicism doesn't have that, has stability uh, as its kind of anchor as far as its philosophical ideals. Um, the Anglos believed this divine favor that involved movement intrinsic in the manifest destiny doctrine. So religion played a very important moment. And this is uh, Max Weber, the Protestant work ethic. And I don't wanna go stick too far on this, but what he basically stated was that the, the Protestant work ethic 
made work more godly. And, and this is something, you know, theological in the fact that it, it also, it also, if you think about it this way, those who didn't work were less godly, right? So you always got to think about things in the inverse. What did it feel like to be on the receiving end of that? So if you had this ethic, okay, what if others don't? Are they going to be judged? And they were as less than, as a failure. And this is where um, kind of the idea of the failure to settle the Southwest reflected a lack of character uh, to the Mexican population. So Manifest Destiny was really about land. And, and it was also about trade. So it, it justified the annexation of Texas. And finally, the half of Mexico. But really what it was about was getting to San Francisco. That was the, that was the ultimate goal of Manifest Destiny because it would open up trade to China and beyond. And if you, if you study um, current politics, contemporary politics, they still use it. Uh, Trump used it in the State of Union address, Manifest Destiny to go to the stars, to go to the Mars. So Manifest Destiny never, never ends. Um, so, and this is the end of the, the statement. Um, it's kind of a little fun. You know, I like having a little fun with my, <laughs> it helps me, you know, stay on track. So, but what it really is about, it's all about the Benjamins. And if, and if Harriet Tubman gets on the $20 bill, it's all about the Tubmans, you know what I mean? And, but here's, here's the moral of the story. And I got a degree in theology. I've studied all the religions in the world. I love them all. But there's always this part of me where I'm like, okay, that's not really what they meant, the original founders. And, and a lot of the religion, um, what it boils down to is this. So people use politics, in politics, they use religion to justify things that are, are not religious at all, like getting money and getting land. And manifest destiny is just another manifestation of that. That unlucky, um, that that un, uh, it's it's like an uneasy, you know, marriage between religion and politics where they don't make sense. For instance, uh, in the Bible it says, "Thou shall not steal," right? So uh, <laughs> that they didn't pay attention to that one. Uh, the answer to many of the questions in history comes down to one word: money. Now, I, had a, I had a professor that said that one time that the 99, um, and it was a cool thing to say, the, the answer to 99% of the questions in history, it comes down to money. And land is the only real source of wealth and money that, that we've always had. And we still have all these other things are going to come and go Bitcoin, maybe gold's going to fluctuate, who knows what's going to happen to that um, currency. You name it, oil. It's oil is going to probably we're not going to use that anymore. Eventually, hopefully, but but land is always this this main focus of where wealth really resides, and that's what manifest destiny was actually always about. And they use the idea of manifest destiny and the justification of religion to take what they really wanted was land, and so that concludes my uh, my my presentation for today. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you can use this for your research papers. And I will see you in about a week. Take it easy, everybody.